nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So we'll get started now. So this is lecture 33 on MOS capacitor electrostatics. Uh, we are still thinking about applying bias to a MOSFET uh, to a capacitor structure. This is a metal insulator semiconductor capacitor. And it is in some way a little bit more complicated than the electrostatics of a PN junction. The reason is that here when you apply a bias, charges may accumulate next to the insulator region. And there is a buildup of charge that wouldn't have happened if this oxide was not like a dam, sort of was not preventing the flow of the electrons. And therefore, the electrostatics is a little bit more complicated, but then electron transport is significantly simpler because you do not have any current flow. So that simplifies it. So in some way, uh, that you spend more time on electrostatics. So let's get started. We'll talk about the, the review. We'll start with a review of the problems that we discussed uh, last in last class. And then we discuss the depletion and inversion charges. Uh, this is one of those problems where the exact solution of the electrostatic problem is possible. What do I mean by exact? I mean, had you not been doing exact things for a while now? Uh, actually, uh, we hadn't been because we are looking at depletion approximation. We assume that when you have a, uh, a junction, then most of the mobile carriers are negligible. You only have a certain amount of depletion charge, and that gave us a rectangular uh, charge structure, a triangular electric field, and a corresponding potential. So it was not exact in the sense, because we didn't consider the electrons and holes. But this time, you will see that an exact solution is possible. But then I immediately will show you that exact is not really exact. So let's get started with the DC uh, equilibrium, uh, equilibrium solution. So you remember that we are looking into this particular problem where on the y-axis we look into the amount of electrons that have been accumulated or uh, amount of charge that have been accumulated on the semiconductor side as a function of surface potential phi sub s. And there are these three regions that if the phi sub s is negative, that means with corresponding to a negative gate voltage, we have the blue region where the accumulation charge increases exponentially uh, with, with the applied voltage. On the other side, we have this square root of phi sub dependence up to a point. And beyond that point, if you apply higher gate voltage, then the charge, the surface charge, again begins to increase exponentially with surface potential. Remember this word. This is not with gate voltage. Gate voltage is a completely different dependence. This is with surface potential. It increases exponentially. However, you will see it becomes very difficult beyond 2 phi sub f to change phi sub s at all. As a result, although in principle it will increase exponentially, if you could change phi sub s, but you will see it's very difficult to do so. And that's an important thing to, to understand. So you remember that this is depletion region where you have applied a positive bias. And as a result, you have essentially pushed the holes away, you know, positive bias in the blue. And you have pushed the holes away. And therefore, you have exposed red region in the, in the bottom. Uh, which are this simply the acceptors, exactly balanced like a parallel plate capacitor. And then we also talked about this region having this particular square root of phi sub s dependency as a function of Vg. Do you remember that from this expression, you can actually calculate phi sub s for any gate voltage? How so? 
you, you say, let's say you have two volts, you know all the doping density, oxide thickness, X naught, and every other, all other things, and it will, will have a form of equation X square plus AX equals B. And therefore, you can calculate X, and that gives you phi sub S. Now, something very strange happens when this phi sub S or surface inversion potential, when that becomes equal to 2 phi sub F. What is phi sub F, by the way? Phi sub F is the equilibrium distance between the Fermi level and the intrinsic level, right? So that, that's phi sub S. So if you have more doping, then phi sub S would be larger, right? That will be larger because the, 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 the donor levels will be closer to the valence band and therefore the Fermi level will be closer to the valence band in this particular case and therefore you will have larger phi sub s. So phi sub f, I'm sorry. So in this case, I want to tell you something about this phi sub f, what something very strange happens at 2 phi sub f, and I want to explain to you what that is. And that is a very important point because that's called a threshold voltage, a key parameter in MOSFET. Okay, now you can see, by the way, the phi sub s is where this square root of dependency changes into the exponential dependence. So we need to know why that happens. So let's go slow, very slow. So what happens in the beginning is say that when you begin to apply a positive bias, then gradually the holes begin to move away, are pushed back. You know, they don't like positive charge so from the gate. And so they gradually push back. And as they push back, these red acceptor charges are exposed. These are space charge. Those are exposed, they cannot move anywhere, so they are sort of left behind. But at the same time, you realize that as the positive holes are moving away, because of the band bending, now there is a possibility that this is now becoming a depleted region, right? And there will be a generation of carriers. So now the electrons will begin to generate by this trap-assisted process. As a result, these green electrons will gradually build up. And you can see at some point, that green electron, the magnitude of it, not the total amount, but the height of that grain will equal to the red. So you can see at that point, the red is positive, the electron is beginning to take over. And that is exactly the point what, what it be related to the threshold voltage. And that is exactly when the surface potential will become two phi sub f. So the crossover point, but remember, the total area under the green, the total amount of charge is far smaller yet compared to the red. But this is at least on the magnitude on the height side, they become comparable. Let me prove you, well, prove this to you. So for example, I want to know what happens at two phi sub f. I'm focusing on the electron charge shown here in blue. You know, it, this is sort of getting closer to the Fermi level and therefore they are gradually filling up that pocket with electrons. So let's think about how many electrons I have, right? So how will I calculate that? I have N1 sub N1s, S meaning surface. So I'm asking the questions, how many electrons do I have next to the surface? Well, the formula is obvious. You know the formula from before that Ni, which is the intrinsic concentration multiplied by Ef minus Eis. Right? EIS, generally I would have written EI, the intrinsic level. That you have seen many times. But this time, the intrinsic level, as you can see from the right hand picture, that I is not a constant everywhere. And I is sort of bending over as the bands are bending. Fermi level is not changing. Why not? Because there is no current flow. So there is no gradient of the quasi Fermi level. Whatever value you hold it, the right hand side, remember, is grounded the uh, semiconductor side is grounded, so therefore the red line corresponding to the Fermi level is not moving. As a result, the difference between EI and EF are changing. So therefore, the carrier concentration next to the surface will be EF minus EIS and beta is 1 over KT. So from that, you can easily calculate that. Now the problem is that I still do not know, let's say, what EIS is, but that wouldn't be a problem as I'll show you. Now what I have done, the exponent factor, EF minus EIS, I have split it into two pieces. 
you can see in the magenta, I have taken out EI bulk, whatever value was in the bulk, you know, far to the right hand side where no band bending has occurred. And I have put it back in, in the second exponent. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. Now, EF minus EI at bulk, that is something I know. Because that difference is exactly what phi sub F is by definition. Because I know the doping, therefore I know where the EF is. And I know, of course, what EI is in a bulk semiconductor. So I know phi sub F. And correspondingly, the quantity on the red, EI bulk minus EIS, that's something I still do not know. But do you see that that's equal to phi sub S? Because that's the amount of band bending. EI bulk is whatever was the intrinsic level far to the right. And you can see it has bent gradually. But do you see that the bending is equal to phi sub S, Q phi sub S? Because there's all three bands, E, C, E, V, and E, I, they have bent together. So therefore, you see that that will be equal to phi sub S, the surface, uh, surface band bending. And now, therefore, let's consider the case when the band bending is twice pi phi sub F. So let's say phi sub, uh, phi sub F was 0.3 milli electron, uh, sorry, 0.3 electron volts, and therefore 2 phi sub F, 0.6 electron volts. Let's say I'm thinking about the surface potential when it's equal to 2 phi sub F. Now what is that value? That value, because you have 2 in one place and minus 5 phi sub F, so that will give you 1. But that 1 is exactly equal to Na, because that's by definition is equal to Na. So you can see what happens when you bend the band twice the amount corresponding to the phi sub f, then the majority carrier charge, instead of re holes remaining majority carrier, first they deplete, and then the electron becomes sort of equal to the original hole density. And that's when the inversion will begin, right? Inversion, what does the word mean? That initially you had the holes as a majority carrier, now electrons will become sort of the majority carrier and there is an inversion of the charge, and that's what we, happens at 2 phi sub f. Now, this is a very important quantity for many reasons, and let me just take a, uh, take a minute to explain to you that why this 2 phi sub f, understanding 2 phi sub f, is very important. Because what will happen that most of the time when you uh, will discuss transistor physics a little bit later, but you realize that we are looking into a vertical cart through that MOSFET structure, right? Through the gate, oxide, and the substrate. And we are looking at the amount of electrons, these green electrons, which are forming in a very thin sliver, very close to the oxide. We'll apply an electric field in the drain, and they, these green electrons will flow, right? So eventually, you want them to accumulate easily and in large quantity as soon as possible. So therefore, what do you want? Generally, you want the threshold voltage to be low. Now, how would you reduce the threshold voltage? Look at, look at that expression. It's already telling you how to design modern, modern MOSFET. First of all, well, you know, if you wanted to reduce the threshold voltage, what would you do? You will decrease the oxide thickness. Oxide thickness is X naught, is the oxide thickness. So therefore, in 1970s, it was, let's say, 1,000 angstrom oxide thickness. These days, the oxide thickness is about 10 angstrom, sort of same thickness of as, as, as in a DNA. And therefore, so there is a lot of interesting consequence of that that I'll come and tell you a little bit later. The other thing is that, well, you say that oxide thickness, I can only make it so thin, you know, 10 angstrom is, say, five atoms, five silicon dioxide atoms. And I always tell this story that uh, these days you have 12 inch wafers you know, big wafers, 12 inch. You're trying to put five atoms on top of that. It is like covering the whole United States with six inch of snow, not a inch variation anywhere. Because if you had a little bit low, there'll be too much current flow and that IC is gone. So therefore, this level of control that this is possible technologically, it's simply, it's impossible to believe unless you have actually seen the degree of precision and control people can have. So uh, what I'm showing you on these pieces of papers and uh, this math and everything, this is not the exciting part. Once you see how this technology actually plays out, then uh, you really get the sense that what a remarkable wonder this technology is. 
but for the time being on more mundane things. So let's talk about induced charges in various places, mainly in inversion. So I have gone to inversion region, meaning the green has taken over the red. Right? Rain is mobile, remember, these are electrons which can move. And these are generated through shockley riedel type generation, right? Because it's a depleted region. Now, of course, if I keep pushing more and more voltage, what will happen? Well, I'll get, get, we'll get, we'll be getting more and more green electrons. But how much more? That's the question I want to discuss, discuss next. On the top, I have rewritten the equation because now I might be going above phi sub s, uh, above 2 phi sub f, phi sub s being greater than 2 phi sub f, which is that I'm going beyond the, beyond the inversion point. And well, if you want to do that, that's fine. You will put the same expression, but this time you realize that we will not stop at 2 phi sub f. So the second factor on the first line of the equation, ei bulk minus eis, I'll not put 2 phi sub f anymore. I'll put whatever the phi sub s is. And you can immediately see the carrier concentration now will increase exponentially with phi sub s. If I could change phi sub s, it will increase exponentially. But what I am going to show you now, you cannot. And as a result, it will only increase linearly. Now, this is a sort of a puzzling statement. I want you to understand this clearly, at least through the lecture or later on when you go home because this is one of the most important concept here. So first, let me, and we will get to that in, in a second, but let me tell you a little bit about that green electrons and how they are spread out, because I had been writing this or drawing the green region as a little rectangle. Now, you should have complained in the sense that that doesn't really make sense. Look at the Fermi level, the EF, flat. And look at the EI. EI is bending. So therefore, if I am to, somebody tells you that how many electrons you have as a function of position, you will say, I will take EF minus EI at every point, put it in an exponential, and get the electron concentration. And you can see that therefore, uh, it will go exponentially down. It will spread out like this. And QI is my, my induced charge. So that's the I stands for. And the green will gradually go down. There's no square sitting there, right? So where is that square coming from? That's a very, uh, sorry, the rectangle coming from? Actually, that's a very important concept. And that's why I want to show you that this area under this green uh, region, you can represent it with an equivalent rectangle. And uh, that is a very useful concept. So let me show you how that works. So what is the amount of induced charge? Well, you say, well, I will take it from nx dx, what was the extra, whatever the extra electron is. This is the area under this green curve. And so whatever that is, I will just integrate over. Now, do you realize that that expression nx is ni square nb. nb is a bulk charge. It's not base anymore. There's no base. Base is gone. So here, it is a bulk. Ni square Nb, what is that charge? That's the charge far out to the right. That's the minority carrier in the bulk region, right? But in the bulk region. As you're bending the bands, then at every point, there is a phi, sub, phi of x, whatever the, the distance x. And then as you are bending it more and more, you increase exponentially get larger and larger amount of charge. Beta is 1 over kt, you remember. Now, you can integrate this, right? You can integrate that. And if you integrate that, you will see that, first of all, that instead of the variable dx, you could, because the uh, integration variable is phi. So you, you, therefore, you can multiply and divide d phi dx and multiply with d phi. So you, you see, that, that's equal to dx. And d phi dx, what is that? That is the electric field. So I have placed the electric field over there. Now, in general, of course, the electric field is not constant, right? Electric field is varying in this region. But, you know, if you take a, a derivative of this, it will look like a triangle region, right? This is a highly doped one side and low doped another side. You remember that will be like a triangle. But let me assume, just let me assume that this is a constant. On the average, whatever the average of the triangle is, let me pull that out. And then you can see that the phi sub x 
you can integrate this one now easily. And if you do, you get a very simple and wonderful expression because you see, where does this kt over q come from in the blue, in the bottom line? Well, that's the q and beta. Beta is one over kt, remember. So when you integrate, you pull out that factor. This is the exponential of ax. So when you integrate, you have exponential of ax divided by a. So that is that factor that you have. You can see the average electric field. And what, do you, what else do you see? You see ni squared nb and q phi sub s. What is that ni squared nb q phi sub s? Well, that's equal to the electron concentration. That is the green curve. And kt over q, what is the dimension? What is that? That's the voltage, right? kt is energy, divide by q, right? And then therefore, if you divide by the electric field, what dimension does it have? This has a dimension of a distance. And so W inversion is essentially kT over Q divided by the electric field. That is the width of that rectangle. You see, that is the width of the rectangle because instead of doing that complicated integral, you know the amount of surface charge, N, N of S, N sub S, because as a function of bias, you are easily calculate that one quantity. You just multiply with W inversion on the order of maybe 30 or 40 angstrom, and then that gives you the equivalent amount of charge of the more complicated green curve, right? Now, what this is trying to tell you, that the electrons flow through about 20, 30, 40 angstrom next to the oxide. And for the rest of the things, first it is depletion, then it's a completely charged neutral region. It's a thin sliver of region next to the oxide where all the action happens in a MOSFET. So this is what? the purpose of this calculation. Okay, now what will happen above threshold? As I said, that, that's a very important and interesting thing. So above threshold, you say, okay, the green electrons is moving up with the width of W inversion that you can calculate. And you have this particular expression, Vg equals phi sub s. Phi sub s is the amount of band bending, right? Up to the surface. Now, what is this Eox multiplied by X0? It is equal to the amount of voltage drop in the oxide. Eox is the oxide and then multiplied by X0 is the thickness. Now, I can only write it this simply if there is no charges or anything else in the oxide, right? Because if I had charges in the oxide, then my oxide electric field will not be unique. Up to the charge I will have on oxide field, Away from the charge, I will have another oxide field. So for the time being, I'm saying that that's equal to electric field multiplied by X0 without any charge in the oxide. Okay. Now, do you agree that the electric field can be written as inversion charge plus fixed charge divided by epsilon? Now, do you agree with this statement? Do you remember that when you're an undergraduate student, then they used to have this uh, pill box pillbox for calculating charge that if you want, if you had a metal plate and you had a charge Q, if you wanted to know the amount of electric field that is coming out of that charge, you'll put a little pillbox in here and Gauss, apply Gauss's law and you will see the electric field coming out is the charge included within the pillbox divided by epsilon. Do you remember this? If not, when you go back, just open up any, uh, any undergraduate book and you will see that this is indeed the total amount of charge divided by epsilon that gives you the electric field coming out of a out of a region. And so that's exactly what I have done. You see the green electrons, I have QI, that's the induced electrons, and QF, what is that? That's the acceptors, number of acceptors. So together is the total amount of charge which will send the electric field into the oxide. And so I have, I have this particular quantity multiplied by exon. Okay, that's fine. Now, at threshold voltage, at threshold voltage, of course, uh, my electric field will not be the same, right? Because my voltage is different uh, at, at, at two phi sub waves. Remember, in the top one, Vg, any Vg, not just threshold voltage. So here you will have uh, the threshold voltage. You will again have it two phi sub waves. Remember, phi sub S equals, equals to two phi sub S is when the inversion begins to work. Right? Again, the same formula except one little thing. Do you see the QI? In the top place, you have evaluated at phi sub S. In the bottom place, you evaluated at two phi sub F, right? 
is uh, no complicated thing here. But look at this magic in the next line. Oh, by the way, if you look on the other one, you will have a green, green one, which I should have drawn in the right hand figure, right hand bottom figure, which I haven't drawn. So that is what would have happened at the threshold voltage. Now let's subtract. Now if I subtract, initially it looks a horrendous thing that uh, I have phi sub s, two phi sub f, uh, there, there's a difference of that, the charges are floating around, but you immediately realize many simplifications are possible. Because what I'm going to show you a little bit later, that after inversion, if you do a detailed calculation, it's very difficult to move phi sub s beyond two phi sub f. So let's say phi sub s 0.3, milli, uh, 0.3 electron volt, two phi sub f 0.6. Then you are putting a lot of gate bias now, lot of gate bias. You will see the phi sub s will moving to 0.65 even. When you, were, you, you might have changed the voltage by let's say two or three volts on the gate, but the phi sub s gets clamped, pinned to that value of two phi sub f. I'll explain that in a second, that why that happens. But for the time being, I, I, first of all, that term can be dropped to phi sub s minus two phi sub f approximately can be dropped. Moreover, this is the exponential dependence on phi sub s, right? Remember that ni goes up exponentially. So compared to that, the tiny amount of charge you have in this, in this green region on the right side figure, right side figure, that's a minuscule amount of charge, right? Because this is a tiny region and then the height isn't very much. So compared to phi, QI at phi sub s, you can drop that rate term, or rate term over there. And if you do, then you have this simple one-liner equation. And that tells you how much charge you have when your gate voltage has gone above the threshold voltage. So let's say the th threshold voltage was something like uh, 0.8 volts. You have applied two volts, and then you will use, get this very simple formula. By the way, do you see where the C ox came from? Do you see that? See this a kappa S and epsilon naught divided by X naught, that will give you the oxide capacitance. So that is what I have cross multiplied throughout in order to get this charge. Now look at this formula for a second. First of all, simplicity is good, which is, which is very good. But more importantly, that while the surface charge is moving exponentially, the real charge as a function of gate voltage is moving linearly. I mean, how is that possible? The reason that happens is, is because of the, of the following thing. What happens beyond, beyond threshold is that when you have a little bit, let's say you apply a bias, a little bit charge This is, I'm trying to explain why it changes uh, QI a lot, a little change, because it's exponential dependence. Now think about this for a second. You apply a voltage, and let's say a little bit more charge has accumulated in the inversion region. As soon as the little bit more charge has accumulated, the electric field that is coming out of the semiconductor into the oxide, all in a sudden, that electric field has increased quite a bit, right? Remember, the electric field from the pill box is directly proportional to the charge you have within that box. So you increase the charge a little bit, electric field increases a lot. And then that electric field will drop across the oxide. And so that will eat up most of the gate voltage that you have applied. With a little bit change in the charge, it is like a lever. So a little bit change in the charge, you have a large change in the oxide field and oxide voltage drop, and most of the gate voltage, therefore, the oxide eats up most of the gate voltage above threshold. And very little is required to drop across the semiconductor. That's why this phi sub s gets clamped to two phi sub f. And that's what I wanted to mention that because this electric field is directly proportional to QI, QI goes exponentially with phi sub f, phi sub s, and therefore little change in phi sub s gives you a lot of oxide field, 
and a lot of oxide field then gives you oxide voltage drop and as a result most of the drop goes to oxide not to the semiconductor right and i will show you detailed calculation a little bit later but this is a very important point uh, everybody will ask you down the road that whether you understand this concept precisely or not and at that point when this happens these two becomes almost like a parallel plate capacitor so the blue one is there and the green one responds and the red essentially the effect of red essentially disappears because inversion charge responding to the gate charge that's how a mos capacitor becomes much beyond inversion but i let me quickly tell you that uh, you know electrostatics i'm almost done but generally uh, you cannot keep making x not arbitrarily thin for last four generations in semiconductor technology the oxide thickness have been clamped about to 12 to 10 angstrom i mean 12 13 uh, around that range and it has not been scaled the reason there is so a crisis in the field is because you cannot really reduce the oxide thickness anymore it's not technology problem technology could give, allow you to go even thinner the problem is tunneling current but before that let me first tell you that if you had to calculate the current across this structure what theory would you have used you'd have used thermionic emission theory right why you know discontinuity in the conduction and the valence band what uh, what other theory will you use it's not diffusion theory here right and how will you calculate that again very simple there is current flowing from semiconductor to the gate region and from the gate to the semiconductor region so you have the qivg the one that you just calculated right the green green electrons just calculated and what fraction of it will be able to make it well you see that exponential of delta ec multiplied by beta right delta ec is this discontinuity discontinuity because that is how much it has to be above in order for the electrons to flow from the other side will you'll have the metallic whatever the metallic electron concentration is n sub m and then you have the delta ec of course but remember for the electrons from the metal side in order to go to the other side it has to additionally go over that q v ox because v ox is the amount extra drop that has happened you can see the second side term will die very quickly and even the first term delta ec for a typical system silicon dioxide silicon 3.1 ev so 3.1 ev over beta well that's zero very nice uh, this is zero beyond machine precision in some ways and so therefore this current is minuscule no problem so generally you do not have any thermionic emission current however of course it's so thin that the tunneling current remember the triangular barrier and other things chapter one we did that will of course uh, will easily get through a 10 angstrom region where have we seen this again in, a, in, a, in another context zener tunneling do you remember then zener tunneling also the reverse bias electron flowing through these are all the same same concepts and therefore in that case there will be a significant amount of tunneling and this tunneling must be calculated quantum mechanically chapter one the same formula rectangular barrier only difference from chapter one that now you have to use effective mass for the electrons but over there we just use free electron mass that's the only difference but other than that this is exactly the same calculation and what happens that if you have too much too much current flow then essentially you have a lot of tunneling and that is not acceptable because that's why your laptops get hot even when it's off not doing much calculation it leaks out a lot of current and that's not acceptable simply looking more like a bipolar base current you see the sort of current is going out through the base of the current i put the oxide there so that i don't want to worry about the base current but now the oxide has become leaky and it's not no longer doing the function it was supposed to do now very quickly this is something i have to show you one one time in your lifetime just to show how it works out uh, so the electrostatics as i said can be solved exactly so far in every problem that we have done we have looked into just the depletion approximation so we have just nd and na we have worried about and we have assumed p naught and n naught to be zero 
in the depletion region. But in this particular case, it's not necessary. And let me quickly walk you through that how it works. By the way, the formula that you saw, saw this is on depletion approximation. Remember when I was calculating the red region, how far it is depleting. I was not really thinking about the uh, this green electrons. And I didn't really think about that explicitly. I put it back in later on, but the exact calculation is possible. So let's do that. I'll just walk you through the derivation. You really have to sit down with the pencil and paper uh, to, to do this. So you generally normalize the variable to save you some writing. Phi sub x, you'll divide by kt over q. So that, uh, and you know the de definition of phi sub s in terms of EI and EI bulk and EI at a given point. And the surface potential, you can normalize it again with kt over q and you write it as u sub s. That's just to indicate the normalized surface potential. And uh, the Fermi level, instead of writing phi sub f, you will write u sub f, again normalized with kt over q. Uh, no, this is, this is uh, no, no problem. And then once you are done, now do you realize this statement? That once you are, you are done, the number of holes at any given point is given by Ni, Ei minus Ef, right? And the number of electrons is Ef minus Ei. But other than that, it is exactly the same. And you can see that Ef, with the sign change, I have written as Uf in the last one. And you don't see any beta there. Why? Because the last expression, I have normalized it with kt over q. That's why you don't see any beta. But other than that, it's exactly the same expression. The number of holes, well, they are also the same. And do you see n multiplied by p, what is that? Ni squared, right? So you can see that's what should happen. Right? Because it's an equilibrium, that's what should happen. And then nd plus, again, you can write it. And you can see ef minus ei bulk, you can write it in terms of phi sub f, the Fermi, Fermi uh, differential and normalize it so that you write it in terms of u sub f. Na, well, uh, what should I say? This is, this is very simple. Now, one thing you should realize that I, in this expression, I am assuming either the donor is present or the acceptor is present. If they are simultaneously present, then the uf that you have, of course, you cannot insert it, that uf in one of them and get the answer. So it assumes one of them is present, not necessarily both. All right, so I can write this expression. You know, just copied it from the last slide. And only thing I have done is that normalized uh, the psi I have written is at kt over q multiplied by u. Remember that one? Psi is just nearly normalized. So divided throughout. And this whole expression on the right, I will call it g u comma u sub f. Do you see that if you knew somehow somebody told you what u is and somebody told you what u sub f is, then you can calculate the right hand side. Not that anybody will tell you, you'll have to find it. But if you knew u at any point and u sub f, the doping, then you can do the right hand side. Left hand side, I still don't know. Now this is the trick. Why this is people teach you this. So you see, what I have done in this equation, this is a second derivative on the left hand side, and the right hand side is a solely a function of u. And these always have this neat trick of solving this equation exactly, that you multiply on both sides with the first derivative. Okay, that's not a problem, that, that I can do. But the next step is what makes it very interesting, because you see, the left hand side, du dx squared, if you take a derivative of that, what is that expression? That becomes 2 du dx, and then take, you, you, that, take one more derivative. You, you can immediately see that's exactly the preceding, preceding line, right? But look at what it does to the right-hand side also, that if you multiply the du dx and then multiply with dx on both sides, do you see the dx's will disappear from everywhere, right? Do you see this? Because the dx, you get, that will cancel and the dx from the first derivative, that will go away. So d, dx's have gone away. This is undergraduate math. Uh, it's, 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 if you remember differential equations from those old days, you'll remember that this is where, where it comes from. But you can see I have also done something, one over ld squared, 
is whatever that bunch of constant n i k t over epsilon, I've called it a l d squared because it's a dimension of a length squared. And that has a name called Debye length because that is the distance over which the electrons sort of fall off to the equilibrium value. Remember the green one, the green electrons which are sort of going down exponentially, the extent of that could be in this case LD. Okay. I'm not still done, but I can calculate this quantity easily, you see. Do you agree with this statement? Because do, what is du dx? du dx is electric field, right? du dx, normalized electric field. And so I have differential of that. So when I integrate, I will just simply take the square out. Now you can see on the top side, I have put the top limit, qex over kt. Uh, what happens to the bottom point? the zeroth point, the electric field on the very right side, where I am integrating between very right side next to the oxide, right? That's the range. On the very right side, I don't have any electric field, bulk region. So therefore, the second limit doesn't come in. And the rest of the thing is, again, you do this integration, and let's say you do this integration, you get this factor, F, U, and U, F. How do you do this integration? Well, you do it numerically. It cannot be done analytically, right? Remember, the G was a complex expression, and so therefore, you do it numerically at any point. Okay. Now, therefore, the surface potential, if you wanted to know surface potential, that we, this EX is at any position X. So if you wanted to know at the surface, so on the left-hand side, you'll put E sub S, that's the surface potential. On the right-hand side, what should you put instead of U? You should put U sub S, because that's the... Uh, the potential band bending on the surface. And this is your final expression because look, phi sub s multiplied by that E ox multiplied by x naught, that from that expression, from the expression before, I can write it. Now this is something we have done before in the following form. This phi sub s is that phi sub s, this simple approximation is that whole thing is over there, is the first term over there, is the second term over there. So this is the depletion approximation, the poor man's version of this more complicated expression where all the charges have been accounted for, you see? Now, how will you calculate this? This is the algorithm and you have already done it for your homework, if you have done your homework properly. You will begin with a surface potential. You'll assume a surface potential. Let's say I assume 0.5 electron volts. Then I will correspondingly normalize it, divide by kT over Q, and get a value of U sub S. Okay, so I'll get some number. Then I'm going to divide it into, let's say, 10 pieces. So every piece will be 0.5 divided by 10, 0 0.05. So my gaps are 0 0.05. 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, this list column of numbers. That's my U. And once I have the U, did I not tell you that we can calculate G? U sub F I know, because that's the doping. And U is for every point that I have in the column, if you call a MATLAB function, it will in one second calculate that G. Uh, the, the, the G. And once you know G, of course you can calculate F. Right? F is a numerical integration of that G. So you call another MATLAB function, you get your G, uh, you get your F. You get your F, then you get your F side electric field on the surface. Remember, that's easily related to the F, and therefore you can calculate VG. And then VG becomes sort of the output now. The input becomes phi sub S. So you go the other way around. Remember in the previous one I said VG is known, Vg equals Ax plus Bx squared. That is how you get the uh, phi sub s. But here you go the other way around. But it's still the same result at the end you get. So let me tell you, just tell you that if you did this calculation at home, then this is what you have gotten. You would have gotten in the accumulation a strong buildup of charge. Do you see a thin region like a spike moving up in the sky? Very, very high electron concentration. Uh, I'm sorry, hole concentration, accumulation, right? Accumulation next to the surface. 
Now in the depletion region, do you see that cross hazarded region? That is how far the holes have been pushed back. This is the red region that I was talking about. And you can see that it's not a like a square box moving right because this has a tail because the electron concentration is not, sorry, the hole concentration doesn't immediately fall to zero at the edge of the depletion region. It gradually goes to zero. So therefore you have that tail. Look at the surface potential, what this is doing. The U is the surface potential, right? How much it is? It's 10. So you have to multiply with KT over Q to know exactly what the surface potential is. And do you see that that was almost like a square on the top? And therefore, this has the corresponding potential, shape of a potential that we have seen before. Now, you put more gate bias. Now, do you see that the depletion region is sort of, it's almost clamped to where it was, but now extra charges are building up. The spike going to minus two, let's say, the extra charges are building up. Now, these extra charges are electrons now. That is the green electrons gradually moving up. And you see that how that is exponentially dying. That was this rectangular region I sh showed you, right? And you will see that is on the order of maybe 20 to 50 angstrom, very thin region over which electrons are building up. And the strong inversion. So you put a lot of electric field and then for you can see it has electron concentration has go to 400 now very thin region and essentially it will increase exponentially but this charge is directly proportional to the uh, gate field now notice this carefully because i want you to see this see that that's 10 right minus 10 below so you are going from depletion to inversion so when you apply more bias in the depletion region you see you have band bending up to 20. So the band is bending very nicely when you are still in the depletion region, right? Band is bending qu quite a bit. But look at what happened after you have inverted and beyond that point. Look at, that's about 25 or so. And that's about 25. You have gone from two to 400 in the charge. And look at the surface potential. It has only probably moved at 5. 5 meaning 5 multiplied by kT. So surface potential doesn't want to move anymore. And that's the key thing. That's how we could neglect that. Phi sub S minus 2 phi sub F and set it to 0. Look at another thing. This is the depletion region. And that increases a little bit. You see point. Uh, because in the depletion region, as you have more charge, look at that 0.5, it was almost dead on the charge over there. It is now 0.75 or so. It has extended a little bit. But once the inversion has occurred, then look at this. This essentially, that 0.75 where it has sort of clamped. Because all new charges will come to the depletion region. It will not go to the, uh, sorry, will go to the inversion charges and will not go to the depletion. You see? Because total amount of charge has to be equal to the gate, gate charge. So whoever can give you the charge, in this case the inversion charge, if they can give it, the capacitor likes the charge close to as close as possible to the surface, the other charge. Because that minimizes the total electrostatic energy. That's why, you, you know, in principle charge balance could have told you that this extra charge could be either here or to the right. But why is the charge here, not over there? That is because that when you have a set of charges, the charges wants to be as close as possible given the constraints because that minimizes the total electrostatic energy. That is the equilibrium concentration. Okay? So that's a very important point that why inversion occurs next to the oxide, not anywhere else. But finally, let me quickly tell you that the exact is not really exact. If you try to boast uh, about it, you cannot really because first of all, you know, that little notch, that's a triangular barrier in chapter one. Did I not give you homework? Airy function and all, if you have a triangular barrier where the bound levels are. So you will have a phi sub s and the electron concentration doesn't increase exponentially like that because of the charge confinement, so the wave function needs to be accounted for. Second, 
is that because of the quantization, band gap is no longer just EG. Because the first place where electrons can sit is not on the bottom of the band, but the first quantized level. Right? So your band gap is actually increased a little bit. So therefore, your exact expression, you didn't account for any of this when you are doing the full exact, quote unquote, exact solution. And the non-degeneracy assumption, remember? Everything I'm saying, exponential of Q phi sub S over KT and all. When does it, does it talk, uh, occur? Non-degenerate assumption. Where is your Fermi level? Fermi level is now inside a band. You are using your non-degenerate assumption. Is that, is that a good way of doing business? Not really. So these have to be all corrected for if you really wanted to do a proper simulation, especially modern MOSFETs. So let me conclude. So I just wanted to emphasize on the physics of the induced charge, those green electrons, and uh, how they change as a function of gate bias. Now, generally current through the oxide is not very important, but these days it is. Uh, this is something why the oxide thickness have not scaled for last four generations, and people are trying to change silicon with other substrates so that they can get a little bit extra current. Previously, people could get current simply by reducing the oxide thickness, no more. And that's why there is all sorts of crisis in the, in the, uh, in the industry. And finally, the exact solution is not necessarily exactly exact. Okay, that's it. Thank you.